Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here and start enjoying what you are listening to, please head on over and hit that subscribe button. And don't forget the bell icon. Set that one to all so you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video, which happens to be daily. Also, if you are curious on how to become a member of the channel or would like to tip me with a coffee, all of that information can be found down below in the description. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Scary Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Quick detail, this was almost two years ago when my husband and I just moved into a townhouse. We have our front door with a regular deadbolt lock, and our back door has, no joke, five different locks. Our city isn't always the safest, so we didn't question. About one month after we moved in, we get a knock on our door. We were confused, but maybe it's a neighbor needing something, so my husband opens the door. It ended up being a man we haven't seen before, and he said he was a maintenance man here to fix our back door. We explained to him that we did not call him, or anyone, and that our back door was completely fine. He kept insisting that he was at the correct place, and we kept insisting, no, he was in fact not. What threw us off was the fact we have not personally seen him before. We have met most of the workers since we needed some things fixed when we first moved in here. And he also wasn't wearing a uniform like they usually do. Next thing we know, he goes, let me show you, and just walks right in and heads to our back door. My husband gives me a look as if saying, get up and get behind me, because it obviously made him nervous. The guy walks over to our door and looks surprised, seeing all the locks. He undoes them all and opens it for a quick second before saying, <laughs> Oops, wrong place, and then turns around and walks back out the front door without another word. My husband locks everything back up quickly, and we literally never see this guy again. We didn't do anything as of calling the office like we should have, but we thought maybe we were overreacting and that maybe it was just the wrong place. But I also feel like we were being scouted in some way. Sorry, I know this isn't very crazy as a story, but it scared the hell out of both me and my husband. I was 14 at the time. I lived at home with my parents and my 10-year-old sister in a normal suburban house in Connecticut. I had always believed in ghosts, and I never had any experience with anything and never wanted to. My mom had always been infatuated, loved, and she still does, ghost shows and paranormal TV, finds it fascinating, and is always open to it. Six months prior to this event, my aunt, my mom's sister, was diagnosed with melanoma. It was terminal, and treatment did almost nothing as the disease progressed. It was really a waiting game to see when, not if, the treatment stopped working. Towards the end of our treatment, I distinctly remember a heaviness in the house. Whether it was my mom's sadness or maybe just a feeling, being home just felt dark. For context, it's important to know the layout of my upstairs. My house was a standard two-story, four-bedroom home. The room was directly next to the staircase, with my parents' and sisters' rooms being on the other end of the house. 
right next to each other. My house was old-ish, not like haunted old, but maybe 30 to 35 years old. The floors upstairs would creak if you walked on them. My sister and I knew it all too well when we would sneak around at night to get snacks and my father would catch us. One night before my aunt's passing, I'm laying in my bed with the door open to my room. The hall nightlight dimly lit the area, just enough so it wasn't pitch black. As I'm laying there, I distinctly remember this gut-wrenching feeling of a heavy energy and uneasiness in the house. I hated my door being open, but my parents had a rule where it needed to be for safety. As I'm lying there, and all of a sudden, hear this horrific running, heavy footsteps from my parents' room, down the hallway, and then down the stairs, fast, heavy footsteps. I sat up immediately and just listened. The footsteps went down the stairs, fast as hell, the heaviness being the scariest part. Think of a big man in work boots, going downstairs, as if their life depended on it. Next thing I knew was the light turning on and my father hauling ass down the stairs. I could hear him searching the house. All the while, my mom's at the top of the stairs looking down. I ask, What's going on? And she asks me, Were you out of bed? To which I said no. My dad came back and asked me the same, checked on my sister, who was sound asleep, and then double-checked everything that nobody was here. My mom ended it with a just stay in bed for the rest of the night and left it at that. Nothing more. I remember being more scared than I have ever been before. It was my first unexplained encounter. My mom told me it might have been someone coming to visit before taking our aunt home. I don't know how I felt about that, but either way, those footsteps still remain in my memory forever. I'm not sure if telling this story is right about now, but I thought this was incredibly creepy. Junior year of high school, my parents got a job offer out of state, and so I was forced to move all across the country. I started a new school late into the academic year, mid-March, and had a hard time fitting in to the new school. All I wanted was to make a friend, but was too shy to talk to anyone. It was around this time that my friends left MySpace to join Facebook, so I did the same to keep close to them. Some days later, I received a friend request from David. David was a guy that I had been friends with in my old town. Mm, well, he wasn't exactly my friend, but rather the friend of another friend. My friend Jerry had introduced him to the group and would bring him along every time all of us hung out. We knew that David was a year older than us and that he had gone to a different school, but other than that, we didn't really know anything about him. In fact, we kind of always just referred to him as Jerry's friend because he never even bothered to talk to any of us. So when I received a friend request from him on Facebook, I was more than confused. He had hardly spoken to me when I had lived near him. So for him to want to be friends with me after all of this time, it just seemed a little strange. But... I was also lonely and desperate for friends that I didn't care. Other than that, nothing really seemed off about him, at least not at the time. Looking back, I do remember that he hardly had any pictures or friends when I first accepted his request. But, like I said, this was around the time that people had just started using Facebook, so it didn't seem all that weird for him. To have such a barren profile and over the years his friend list got a lot bigger even more so than mine so i didn't really think anything of it but anyway i digress i accepted his friend request and it was just like this 
that David and I became friends. He told me he just started university and that he was lonely because he was too shy to make friends. I told him that I was having a hard time in my new school for the same reasons, and we bonded over that. Little by little, we started talking more. He shared his problems with me, and I shared mine with him. And when it was time for me to apply to a university, he even helped me out. He taught me how to sign up for my SATs and ACTs, helped me apply to scholarships, and even paid for one of my application fees using a Visa gift card, so I didn't receive any of his personal information, and he didn't receive any of mine. Then, when I finally started university, he helped with that as well. He told me where to buy books, gave me studying tips, provided emotional support. So, when he was asked for my phone number, I didn't even hesitate to give it to him. David was my best friend, and I wanted to keep him close, even if we were physically away from each other. It was around this time that David started sharing more of his life with me, and all of it was pretty normal stuff. He had a job at Pizza Hut, which he hated, but needed to keep in order to pay for bills. He also played soccer, but not for his university or anything. It was just a group of guys that got together on the weekends to unwind. I think the biggest thing he told me was that he had flunked out of university and that I was the only one that knew because he was too embarrassed to tell anyone else. And at one point, he also had to move back in with his mom, which he hated a lot. Two, maybe three years into our friendship, my family decides to take a trip back to the city where we had lived prior to move all across the country. And I excitedly tell him and all of my old high school friends. Most of them were pretty excited about the idea of all of us hanging out together. Again, because after high school, we had just gone our different ways. But when I contacted David about it, he showed little interest in hanging out with us. I thought it was weird. You know, I wasn't some stranger he had met online, but rather someone who had been in his life for many years now. I kept insisting and asking for a reason, and then he finally gave me one. He told me that his pictures had been heavily edited, and he was afraid of disappointing me if we met in real life. I told him that it didn't matter what he looked like, and that I just wanted to meet him. But he still did not want to hang out. Instead, he just started being a huge dick to me. He knew exactly what buttons to push, knew all of my insecurities and secrets, and had started using all of that knowledge to hurt me. So, I just stopped talking to him. Some weeks later, I meet my friends as planned, and much to my surprise, I see David there, looking like he did in his pictures. I didn't understand why he had lied about photoshopping his pictures, or why he said he didn't want to meet me only for him to show up at our friend's house. But I was so angry at him that I didn't ask any questions. I just kept waiting for an apology, but David wouldn't approach me. He was treating me like he treated me back when we were in high school. I was really upset, but given that he had been such a huge dick to me, I just figured that this was a another attempt of getting under my skin. We were all drinking and talking about what we were up to, and when it was his time to share, he pretty much just said the same things I already knew about him. He said that he wished he was still in university like the rest of us, but that he had flunked out and that he was just living with his mom. Said that he was miserable there and that he wanted to move out, but that his job at Pizza Hut wasn't paying him enough for him to move out from his mom's house. At this point, though, I was already pretty pissed off, and the alcohol had given me just enough courage to finally ask him why he had been ignoring me. He apologized, but admitted that he hardly remembered me. That deeply hurt my feelings, but also pissed me off even more. 
I told him about Facebook and about our text messages, and he just kept insisting that he didn't use Facebook. Apparently, he had used MySpace at one point, but had just stopped using that when he had switched over to Tumblr. A Facebook account was something that he didn't even consider making. I asked him about the text messages, and he just said that I had probably confused him with another David because he had never had my number. I thought that denying it was a lousy excuse, but Jerry backed him, which pissed me off even more. The thing, though, was that David hadn't just been talking to me on Facebook, but also to a bunch of us. So, when we kept calling him out on his shit, he just told us to text this David guy to prove that it wasn't him. He set his phone on the table, and I texted him. But no new messages appeared on his phone. Then, while we were all arguing about how we need to give us some time, the David that I had been talking to for years responds, proving that we had been talking to a fake all along. Things turn pretty awkward at this point, with all of us feeling angry and betrayed, and David obviously feeling extremely violated. So, with all of us wanting answers, we opened up our friend's laptop and searched for David's profile on Facebook. The first thing that David points out is that whoever this was, they were using his mother's maiden name and not his real last name. And that, while most of us on his friends list were people that he knew in real life, none of them were people that he had kept in contact with. His display picture was also of a dog, which he had owned years ago, but that he had since died, just like the fake David had told me. All measures that, looking back, I'm guessing were used by this person to keep David's close friends from actually finding him on Facebook. The elder pictures on Facebook had been taken from his MySpace back when he still had that account, but most of the newer ones had been taken from his Tumblr, which he apparently uploaded pretty often. The weirdest thing, though, was there was some pictures he swore he had never seen before. These were all pictures of the soccer games taken from the audience which the fake David had said his brother had taken. The real David said his brother never went to his games, neither did any of his family members or friends. Further exploring his own fake profile, David pointed out that while a bunch of status updates were of things that had never happened, a lot of them were accurate. Whoever this person was, they had been watching David for a long time. They knew his schedule, knew what movies he went to, knew what ice cream flavors he liked, knew his friends' bands, knew practically every single thing about him. We did confront the fake David, but he never answered the text messages and instead deleted the profile before we had a chance to examine it any further. So, we never did get any answers. I don't know why that person pretended to be David for so long, or why they even did it in the first place. All I know is that I felt extremely violated for sharing all of my private details of my life with him, and of course, I also felt a great deal of pity for the real David. I wondered for the longest time how this person found him, and how they managed to learn so many private details of his life. Then, a few months back, my mother calls me saying that she found a profile with her name, but the pictures on it, my middle name is my mom's first name, something that very few people know. She thought that I had made a second profile and I didn't tell her the truth because I didn't want to scare her, but truth was that I didn't even know that profile existed. I have always kept Facebook set to private, and I no longer accept random friend requests, nor do I post my pictures anywhere else. So, this profile only had really old pictures of me, and nothing weird like David's soccer game pictures. But it was still active 
and had been active for a while. None of the friends were people that I even knew, and none of the updates were of things that I've been doing in my real life. So, I don't know if the profile belonged to the same person that stalked David, but I'm extremely average looking, so I don't know why anyone would want to use my pictures when there are way prettier girls online. So, I'm guessing it had to be him. I don't know. I just reported the profile and it no longer exists. But I wonder if this person is still pretending to be me or if they've moved on to somebody else. This isn't my story, but it's an allegedly true story from a guy named Rory. I still think about this every now and then, and I don't know if I've come to terms with it yet. This occurrence transpired on the 4th of July of 1991. We were going to a 4th of July party on this day. Me, my wife, and my kids. My wife's cousin, Eddie, was throwing a party and invited us over. So, bright and early at around 8.30 in the morning, Eddie called us, asking if I could go by his house and help set up things in his yard for the party. Of course, I didn't mind doing so, and I said yes. And I made a cup of coffee for the ride and headed on over to his house. I got there and found two of his friends helping, along with his dad, who was 74 at the time. God rest his soul, he was a good man. Helping as well, already bringing chairs out from the cellar. They asked if I could start by placing some of the chairs out along the pool area, and when I was finished, to start bringing out some coolers for the beer and soda. I got all of the chairs lined up, brought out the coolers, and put them where they needed to be. So, what's next? I asked. His dad chuckled and said, <laughs> Boy, you're fast. I'm getting too old for this shit. As the saying goes for us old folk. His dad was a great man, always cracking jokes about his age. Eddie then asked if I could grab one of the foldable tables that were on the patio. He said it was light and that it would take two seconds to bring over. Not a problem, I said. I ended up grabbing two tables instead and brought both to the yard. I opened one up and set it to the side. As I opened the second table, one of my fingers got caught beneath the table where the legs unfold and cut my finger pretty bad. And now I said, Ah, I'm getting too old for this shit. His dad laughed but was concerned for my safety. It really wasn't that bad of a cut, but I was bleeding a lot. Most likely hit a vein. So he jogged inside and got a first aid kit and bandaged up my finger with some iodine, gauze, and tape. And, since my finger was now injured, his dad called me a liability and said I should head back home to get some rest before the party. I agreed with the old man and said goodbye, and that I would see them later, and to make sure that there were plenty of hot dogs, burgers, and brewskis, because I would be coming back with an appetite. Right before I opened my car door, there was an odd smell floating around me, like the ocean, but Eddie doesn't live anywhere near the seaside. I got into my car, buckled my seatbelt, and drove off. I pulled up to the bottom of the street and looked to my left for any oncoming vehicles. There wasn't any traffic. I wanted to listen to some music, so I turned on the radio and proceeded to turn right. And that's when I heard a loud crash. And that was the very moment that I knew I had died. I was standing in the street and saw myself inside my car, surrounded by smoke coming from the collision. The airbag was deflated. My body was draped over, leaning in the passenger side of my car. The person that crashed into me was a man, and he was standing outside of his car, trying to catch his balance. Blood was trickling down his face. I was confused. 
touching and feeling my own body, wondering how any of this was even possible. And then, I felt like someone's hand had grazed at the back of my neck. I turned around, but no one was there. I turned back around only to now see whom I think was the Grim Reaper. He was wearing a hooded black cloak, but his face was pale white. His body was large with long, bony fingers. He was smoking cigar after cigar with every pull consuming half of the cigar. He called me a chicken shit and said that life would have been better if I would have stayed with my girlfriend from high school as he lit another cigar with the one he had just finished. I asked him how my life would have been better with my girlfriend from high school. She passed away a year after we graduated in a boating accident. She drowned when the boat capsized from an oncoming wave, and she got stuck in one of the cabins as it sank. He took another pull off of his cigar and told me to follow him, that he would lead me to a better place. Soon after he said that, the entire area lit up a golden white color and my ears started ringing. Next thing I know, my bedroom alarm is going off and my wife is lying next to me. This entire thing was a dream. I shut the alarm off and sat on the edge of the bed, blown away at how real this dream felt to me. I looked down at my hands and my finger was hurting. The same finger that I had cut while setting up the tables at my wife's cousin's house in my dream. But it was only a dream. None of it was real. Until an hour later, when my house phone rang. It was Eddie, my wife's cousin, asking if I could come to his house and help set up things for the 4th of July party he was throwing. Have a wonderful and blessed evening, everyone. Oh, and sweet dreams as well. From when I was about 11 to 14 years old, I had a best friend named Spencer. Spencer had a decent sized family and a big house. We hung out practically nonstop outside of school. He was homeschooled and I was in public school. During the summer, I practically lived at their house. Spencer had an older brother named Keenan. Keenan was about five years older than him and I, and I thought he hung the moon. He was seriously so cool. He listened to great music and played guitar, and I always wanted to be around him. One summer when I was 13, Keenan went to a summer camp. He was supposed to visit the Grand Canyon and go kayaking and do a ton of fun stuff. We were jealous. It was weird not having him around all the time since I basically stayed at their house the entire time. Finally, the day came where Spencer's dad was supposed to go to the airport to pick Keenan up. We were super stoked and hear all about the camp. Keenan walked right up behind me and gave me a laugh while giving me a hug. Anyways, we helped him unload his luggage and stayed up until midnight talking about his summer. He had so much to say. He said he had the time of his life and told us all about how he almost went overboard white water rafting and how he surely would have drowned if he did. As two 13-year-old boys, we were enamored by Keenan and everything he did. We talked about how Spencer and I were going to go to the same camp once we turned 18. It had been a long day, and it was time for all of us to go to bed. Keenan told us he would tell us more in the morning when we woke up. I awoke and checked my phone somewhere around 3.30. The house was dark, and I had to tiptoe to be quiet and make sure not to wake anyone up. As I walked through the den on my way to the kitchen, I see the moonlight spilling into the living room, the only light in the house. I see what I think is a large silhouette, and as I get closer and my eyes adjust, I see Keenan hanging from the ceiling fan. I freak out and run across the room in a dead sprint and turn the light on to see if my eyes were deceiving me. 
It was him. Except he was asleep and standing in the middle of the room underneath the fan with one of his arms raised straight up over his head. I never knew Keenan to sleepwalk before and luckily he snapped out of it before I tried to wake him up. He looked at me super confused, looked around and noticed where he was and said, Oh yeah, um, I forgot to tell you guys, I guess I developed a bit of a sleepwalking habit at camp. This happened between 1987 to 2012. All names have been changed for privacy reasons. The following story is 100% true. The years listed above are the estimated dates that this story roamed free for me. It was the only time in my entire life that I ever questioned my own sanity and or my own perceptions. I ask that you listen to this story in full as this is one of those few cases where there is an actual ending to the story. I'm writing this today because I believe this story is one we can learn from. Location. Mid-sized city. Located roughly two to two and a half hours southwest of Chicago. The town sits right on the Mississippi River, bordering the state of Iowa. The lady in the woods was sighted at a small park, smack dab in the middle of town. The park is surrounded by roughly four to five acres of timber. Sometime in roughly 1993 or 1994 was the first time I heard about the lady in the woods. I was in fifth grade, hanging out with some other boys on the grade school grounds. The story is your typical ghost story. At Mill Park, our local hangout just blocks away, a child went missing after the sighting of a ghost, more specifically, the ghost of a woman dressed all in white. They didn't know the name of the child, but claimed it happened in 1987. Another boy chimed in. There was also an adult who went missing. The night after a sighting of this same ghost a few years later, in both cases, the sightings happened after the park closed, well after midnight. The park is nestled in between neighborhoods, and there have been reports of people who have moved out of their homes after seeing the woman drift through the woods. There were other kids I heard in the years after that included witchcraft, Satan worshipping, kidnapping, murder, and the occult. The story gained more momentum when another boy in our class, a few months later, found a pentagram spray painted on a tree on a path near the park. We actually rode our bikes out to see it. It was definitely there, crudely painted in what looked like a real hurry. It was one of those things where there was no real way to know if the pentagram was part of the story or was put there because of the story. When you're in fifth grade, you rarely stop to think these things through. You only see what's in front of you, and what I was saying was definitely creepy. May 1995. A friend of ours named Michael lived only a block away from Mel Park. His parents decided to allow him to have a sleepover for his birthday party. He invited 10 of us boys to stay the night just doing what boys do. God bless those parents, by the way. That night, you can imagine where this thing headed. Michael knew all the Mel Park ghost stories. He lived the closest of all of us and had a neighbor who gave him all kinds of crazy information, or so he claimed. He rehashed a lot of his stories we had already heard and even added a few others after some time, and as the clock made its way near 1 a.m., it finally happened. One of the boys suggested we sneak out, see if we could find this lady ghost. So, that's exactly what we did. We all made it outside, quiet enough, and made our way to Mel Park. Once we made it to Mel Park, we broke up into groups. 
A few walked onto the overgrown Little League baseball field. A few headed towards the playground equipment, near the only streetlight in the park. Myself and another stayed in the parking lot nearest to Michael's house. Yes, we were the skittish ones. I wished I could give you all kinds of cool things we did, but in real life, it's not that cool at all. Essentially, we just kind of walked around, looking, waiting. Really, we had only been there for about 15 to 20 minutes when it happened. I kid you not, just like the story, within minutes of us showing up, it was like a lifetime movie. There she was, in the woods. To my north, I see what looks like a pale white woman, white hair, white flowing clothes, and white pants. In the night, she looked to glow. It was literally the perfect example of what you would think of as a ghost. I have never been so scared in my entire life. To this day, it is still the most terrifying moment I've ever been in. That includes an automobile accident. Everyone saw her. All ten of us. She stuck out like a sore thumb. We jetted. I mean, we ran faster than any of us had ever ran before. All of us completely silent, moving at our fastest rate towards Michael's home and safety. I could embellish here and tell you that she chased us or made a move towards us. I could make it out like her head split in half and bees came flying out. But none of that happened. In fact, she was facing a different way entirely. I don't believe the ghost lady even knew we were there. She looked as if she was simply peering deeper into the woods as opposed to staring out at us frightened little boys running away terrified. That was that. We all made it back safely. We spent the rest of the night worried this lady ghost is going to show up and kidnap us. She never showed. We returned to school and the lady of the woods became legend. All of us shared the story. All of us backed each other up. We even told one of our teachers. She politely listened and then changed the subject. It was the coolest, most terrifying thing that had ever happened to us. We had one of the best campfire ghost stories in history. So, time passes, like it always does. We move on from grade school to junior high, then to graduating high school. Once we got a little older, the story took a back seat to girls and just living life. I wouldn't say the story died. I know we spoke of it in passing. I know the story continued on in the grade school, at least for a short time after we left. One of the ten boys from the birthday party died of suicide shortly after high school, and it took everything in me not to blame this ghost story on that situation. I don't believe the two are related. We all move on to college. I lose touch with all but one of the ten, though a few of them I had on Facebook. 2010. After coming home from college and struggling to find my way in life, I finally start to get my act together. I find a full-time job, married my now wife, got a dog, and even had a couple of kids. Eventually, we purchased our first home, which so happens to be just blocks away from my childhood house. I end up in a little teeny house two streets over from Mill Park. After those floating years, I end up back where it all started. On my days off, I walk my dog in the very park where the lady of the woods scared the shit out of me. This is where you really start to question yourself and your senses. At 27 years old, I would stare at the location where I saw that lady glowing all of those years prior and tried to make sense of it all. Now, older and wiser, you spend a lot more time trying to fill things out rather than just reacting. How in the world did I see a ghost in sixth grade with nine other people 
who all saw the same thing. I know I wasn't dreaming. How could we be collectively dreaming? I know it wasn't imagination. It was really there. What I saw was real, but your brain has a funny way of making things fuzzy. It's hard to explain, but you start to question everything. You know it's real, but you know it's not. That sentence shouldn't be, but that's just how my mind would read the situation. It really was something that I wrestled with a bit, just trying to figure it all out. Summer of 2012. There I am on another walk with my dog, coming up alongside the timber where I saw the lady of the woods all of those years ago. I'm thinking of her again. I'm thinking of childhood friends. I'm wondering if they ever think of that moment like I do. The thought passes as I move along the path that leads me out of the park. In front of me, a large trailer hooked up to a pickup sits in the driveway nearest the park's wooded area. There's a middle-aged man moving some things onto the trailer as I approach. He sees me and says, Hello. I say hello back and then decide to make small talk. I ask him if he's moving. The man responds that he's just recently sold his home. It was his parents' house, and it had sold to a young couple. Closing was coming up shortly. I mentioned a few things and then start to head off, but I stop. Because the ghost story was on my mind, I decided to ask a man I didn't know if he knew of the story. Why I did that is beyond me. It's definitely not something I would normally bring up in conversation. But this house was the closest one to the sighting, and I just needed confirmation that somebody else out there still knew the story. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I basically asked him if he had ever heard the ghost stories. I'll never in my remaining years, forget what happened next. The man looks at me and smiles. He tells me he's heard these stories plenty. I'm actually relieved he had because I didn't actually think through how the conversation would go if he had no clue what I was talking about. I then proceed to give him the shortened version of the story you just heard above. He listened, and I could tell he was interested. When finished, he takes a moment and responds. I used to live in this house before the park was built. My parents raised me there. I moved out in 1983 or 84. I believe the park was built somewhere between 84 to 86. And my parents have been here ever since. My dad passed away in 91. And it was just my mom and I after that. That ghost you saw, that was my mom. I looked at him completely confused. He continues, My mom had some medical issues that started in the mid-80s and continued all the way up until she passed away this last spring. The medicine they had her on would cause her to sleepwalk. I can't even count the amount of times I received calls in the middle of the night from the police department advising me that they had found my mother wandering in the park. I was told recently one of the neighbors moved out because they were tired of all the commotion. My sister lives in Texas. I could never get it through her thick skull that our mom needed to be moved to assisted living. So this went on for years. I found out from some friends that she had become a ghost story to the park. You see, my mom had a favorite robe that was all white and always slept in the same pearl silk pajamas. Everything was white. She even had white gloves she would put on from time to time. I can only imagine what that would look like in the middle of the night. That lamp there over the playground 
would light her up like a Christmas tree. So it was never hard for police to locate her. So you see, the ghost you saw, that was just my mom, sleepwalking probably. I bet I even got a call that night. I'm speechless. The lady in the woods was real. She wasn't a ghost. She wasn't a dream. She simply was a woman. She was this man's mother, lonely and suffering from some medical condition that had her wandering the woods at night. I only wished I knew more. I never saw that man again. The new couple moved in, probably oblivious to the ghost story its previous occupant had created. So, I wonder, does her legend live on? Is there some fifth graders right now hearing the story for the first time of the lady in the woods? How she appears and kidnaps children? How there is a witch who murders those who see her in the middle of the night? 2021. I've moved from that tiny house to a new bigger house in a new city. I no longer visit Mel Park. I never did learn that lady's name, and I always kick myself in the ass for not asking the man more questions. The thing that I find so interesting is how a story can become what it is. How one event and story can impact individuals like it did me. I still think of that lady all of the time. When a story rolls out, that seems impossible. The lady in the wood comes to mind. Sometimes the story is real, but the context is muddled. This single event impacted my approach to everything. I listen. I take it all in. If it seems possible, I hold my tongue. Maybe it is impossible. Or, maybe it's just being interpreted wrong. Thank you for listening to my story. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true scary stories. Please forgive the shortened version of this I wasn't actually going to record today. <laughs> So, as I always do, I want to take a moment and thank the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elliott, Sugar Spite, Tina Mead, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klemko, Anita B., Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Les Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all for remaining the pillars of which BTA stands on. And to the other subscribers and listeners, thank you for your support. For without all of you, I would have no voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.